Good evening and welcome. Our virtual webinar has now opened and I wanna take a few seconds to allow our participants to join. Please take a moment to review the quick facts provided by the Connecticut Department of Public Health that's on the screen now. We'll get started shortly. Welcome to Quinnipiac University's COVID-19 Vaccine Community Conversation, Empowering Communities, Informing Decisions. My name is Janelle Chisera, Dean of the School of Health Sciences at Quinnipiac University, and I'll be serving as the moderator for this conversation tonight. The last time we met, which was January 7th, we had two vaccines authorized by the Food and Drug Administration for emergency use, and our country was on its way to taking an important step to getting people vaccinated. So where are we today? If this were a marathon, which it often feels like, I think we would be somewhere about at the mile 20 mark, meaning that we have really been through a lot, we have endured a lot, we are getting close, but at mile marker 20, we're building leg cramps that could make this last push, which isn't all that short, really painful. As of today, we are approaching 28 million reported COVID cases in the United States. With regard to the vaccines, 82 million doses of the vaccines have been delivered across the country and 65 million doses have been administered. Yet, the US is approaching a staggering milestone. 500,000 deaths reported due to COVID more than any other country, representing more Americans who have lost their lives from COVID <clears throat> than those who lost their lives due to World War I, World War II, and the Vietnam Wars combined. As sad as that milestone is, it comes at a hopeful moment. New virus cases are down sharply. Emergency use approval of an additional one dose vaccine from Johnson & Johnson is just around the corner. Hospitalizations are down and daily trends in COVID deaths, which are a lagging indicator, have turned downward. But what hasn't been dialed back? The need for everyone to do the simple things to protect one another. Continue to wear a mask, wash your hands regularly, stay socially distant, avoid traveling crowds, and get the vaccine when you can. With the emergence of more contagious variants that are already um, in the United States and spreading, there is much more importance now more than ever to follow those simple guidelines to protect one another. It is really important for us to take these simple steps seriously so that we can prevent the potential for a variant driven storm. While it's only been a short period of time since our last community conversation on COVID-19 vaccines, enough has certainly changed. And again, we are here today to help answer questions that you have. I am so honored to have our esteemed panelists with us again today, providing expertise in medicine, law, biomedical sciences, business, and nursing. We are really honored and happy to have a special guest with us today, um, Dr. Gooman, a member of the Allocation Subcommittee of the Governor's Vaccine Advisory Group, who will be able to help provide the most up-to-date information regarding plans for vaccine distribution in the state of Connecticut. As I said before, in some of our other conversations, if you have a question about COVID-19 or its vaccines, you have come to the right place. I am certain we have the experts here to answer those questions. This is the third community conversation in a series of webinars that we will be hosting as we work through this pandemic. The purpose is very simple. It's just to be here to pro provide answers, answers to your questions and to provide you with sound scientific advice and data-driven recommendations. If you missed our previous conversations, please do visit the link provided um, in, the, in the chat in the Q&A below so you can learn what we shared in those conversations. We have added a table of contents to those videos so you don't have to listen to the entire conversation. You can use the table of con contents to get you right to your exact question. So panelists, um, please take a moment to briefly introduce yourself. Mary, can we start with you? Hi, I'm Mary Peterson. I'm a clinical assistant professor in the School of Nursing. Oh. Thank you, Mary. John? Sorry about that. <laughs> John? John Thomas, professor of law at the School of Law at Quinnipiac. I also have public health training and taught for 10 years in the public health school. Great. Thank you, John. Dr. Gooman? Hi, my name is Koram. I am representing the Governor's Council on uh, uh, Advisory Group for Vaccines, and I'm on the subcommittee for allocation, and I'm the immediate past president for Hartford County Medical Association. Thank you. Um, Dr. Mittal? 
I'm Jeff Mittal. I'm an associate professor of biomedical sciences. I'm a microbiologist. Great. Dr. Kuchara? I'm with Lisa Kuchara. I'm a professor of biomedical sciences in the School of Health Sciences. And Dr. Norvis. I'm Mario Norvis, professor of supply chain management in the School of Business. Great. Now, before we begin, I'd like to go over just a few important webinar points. First, this presentation will be recorded and available on demand shortly after it's completed with transcription. Second, we encourage you to engage with us by asking questions in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. You can ask questions using your name or you can ask them anonymously. Finally, if you see a question that comes up that's relevant to you, you can upvote that question by hitting the thumbs up icon. That will cause the question to jump to the top of the Q&A box so we could possibly get to that question sooner rather than later. So panelists, uh, let's get right to this. So Dr. Gooman, thank you so much for being here. I, um, I would like to start with you first. As a member of the allocation subcommittee on the governor's COVID vaccine advisory group, I understand that um, a little over a million doses of the vaccine have been distributed to Connecticut and about 892,000 doses of, the vac of that vaccine have been administered. And that means that approximately 87% of the vaccine doses shipped to Connecticut have made it into the arms of Connecticut residents. I believe that we are at 17% of people within Connecticut have received at least one dose of the vaccine and close to 8% of Connecticut residents are fully vaccinated. Um, for me, I have to be honest, that sounds like great progress. Sounds like we're doing the right thing. And I'm curious, Dr. Gilman, I have two quick questions for you. You know, in your opinion, how are we doing as a state and the second question, which might be a little more loaded question, the governor um, had a meeting just this week announcing Connecticut will continue with age-based approach to their COVID-19 vaccine eligibility. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little more about that. Thank you. Thanks, Janelle, for uh, those statistics and numbers. And I will like to start off by saying that, yes, uh, I feel very happy to say this, that Connecticut has done very well in our efforts to administer vaccines. And Connecticut happens to be uh, among the top five states in the country when it comes to the administration. And I feel very uh, excited to report that almost more than half a million uh, people have received their uh, first dose and quarter of a million people or more than quarter of a million people have received both doses in the state of Connecticut. So to answer your first question, how are we doing? I think we're doing a decent job. Uh, could we do better? Absolutely. I mean, um, among the available doses that were uh, allocated to the state, we have done very well and rapid uh, response to administering those into the arms. And to um, answer your second question, of course, you know, the rolling out process at a large population scale is always a challenge. Uh, however, looking at where we started back in December into like slow progress over time, we have done fairly well in our state when it comes to administering to different uh, population groups and subgroups. So uh, Department of Public Health and Governor's uh, uh, Advisory Group has done a great job in making sure that we are making progress while keeping uh, in mind those certain groups who are frontline workers and healthcare workers, and now we are uh, changing course into some of the other populations. Uh, as of Monday, uh, this past Monday, governor did release uh, some other age-based criteria-based subgroups that will be um, eligible to start scheduling their vaccines. And as of March 1st, the age group over 55 to 64 group will be eligible to start scheduling their vaccines. As of March 22nd, the group will go down to 45 to 54 age groups, and they will be eligible to start scheduling their vaccines at several statewide locations. And starting April, April 12th, uh, this will expand to ages 35 to 44. And of course, a lot of our healthy young people who may be listening into this conversation from our campuses will be looking at, but I don't fit in any of those groups. So the last group uh, will be 16 to 34, and that will be coming May 3rd. So the hope or the goal for the state is to make the vaccines available to any 
anybody who's interested by uh, uh, early you know, summer, and hopefully we will expand the administration process as things evolve with some of the other vaccines. Great, thank you so much for that update. You know, there are several people that I know are trying to get the vaccine. I too am trying to get that for my parents and due to a variety of issues, whether it be shipping or weather or administration issues, people are experiencing, some people are experiencing some, some dif difficulty in getting frustrated with the process. I know the number one complaint I think last week was, people are ending up at websites and trying to get the vaccine and every website they go to, it says they're overbooked or the vaccine is unavailable. So I'm curious, Dr. Duman, you know, what, do we have that same issue here in Connecticut? And I think the more important question is, what is Connecticut putting in place to be able to help with the difficulties that some people are having in getting the vaccine? So uh, thank you for this question. It's uh... It is, as you can imagine, when any uh, policy or any process that is on a, a population scale, uh, the challenges will be there. Uh, um, there are some challenges that you can mitigate and minimize early on, but some things that you learn along the way. So yes, there are, uh, we have heard some you know, people who are trying to connect with their um, scheduling appointments and there were some glitches and challenges, but we, you know, the state DPH and uh, Commissioner Gifford's team has done a great job in making sure that anybody who is eligible is able to connect via one of the several resources to schedule their appointments. Since it opened up for 65 and older age group, there have been uh, there's, uh, uh, ways to connect with the scheduling facilities via statewide system, via vaccine administration management VAM system, and there are some large healthcare systems within state of Connecticut who offer direct scheduling through their websites, through their portals. For example, Hartford Healthcare and for Yale New Haven system will allow, go through those systems. Trinity uh, Health New England will allow through the VAM system, Griffin Hospital the same way. But we hear that you know, some people don't have access to computers. Some people will not have e as ready the uh, uh, connection or tech savvy, so there is option for them to connect via phone calls. Now, I do realize the phone system may take a bit longer than the online system, but you know, if there are some challenges in one system, there is that opportunity to uh, secure an appointment through the other uh, systems in place. Great, thank you so much for that update. Dr. Norbus, I kind of want to turn to you with your expertise and background in supply chain. You know, what, what do you see as happening and, and what do you think it will take to, to get out of this? Um, thank you, Jana. Um, I see that we are in a very dynamic environment from every point of view, but from the point of view of logistics, we are in a, a very dynamic environment. It's a process of flow of materials, which are the vaccines, as well as information, okay? And in this process, uh, there are steps that sometimes are slower than others. And we call that bottlenecks. And uh, within the dynamic of this process, this bottleneck change, sometimes it's one, sometimes it's the other. And eventually governments and organizations uh, come to the rescue uh, with um, resources for that bottleneck until uh, another bottleneck appear okay but um let me let me say at front that i think we are moving in the right direction and i will expand a little bit on that uh, why i think we're moving from the logistic point of view in the right direction at the beginning we have concerns, I remember, about the distribution. We will be able to distribute all the vaccines. And then that concern moved to the, the production of the vaccines until new players come into the game, lately Johnson & Johnson, okay? And more players will keep coming, no doubt will keep coming. And so the, the concern that the concern of the production or the transportation move to somewhere else, the bottleneck move somewhere else. As you say, Chanel, at the very beginning, uh, about 80% of the uh, uh, vaccine that have been distributed in national wide uh, have been applied. And in Connecticut, that number is about 87. Uh, if we look at that some months ago, uh, that was 30%. So 
we are in the process in which the it seems that we have more vaccines that we can uh, that the demand, but the demand is growing, is catching up. Okay, so again, as I said, uh, we are moving in the right, in the right direction, and it seems at this point, from the point of view of logistic, the bottleneck seems to be. Uh, I may be wrong, but the bottleneck seems to be at the very end of the of, of the flow, meaning in the application or in the demand. Great. Like at a personal note. As my hairline reveals, I'm old enough to have gotten my vaccine. I went through the Vaccine Administration Management System, Connecticut VAMS. I advise all people looking forward to getting a vaccine to go to that site. I have given the link in the chat. I registered a little before my age group was eligible and received a notice from the Department of Public Health in Connecticut and asking me now to schedule an appointment. It was very easy. I got an appointment within a, I, no more than a week of registering becoming eligible. So again, the link is there for folks. Um, there's information on that website, but it works very, very efficiently. If you register there, my own personal experience is it works very, very well. Great, John, thank you. Mario, thank you. I'm gonna turn this over to Dr. Kuchara and Dr. Mittal. Can we get a little bit of an update on vaccine approval and development? I understand that the FDA advisory panel will consider approving Johnson & Johnson's one dose COVID vaccine as soon as I believe Friday. So where we stand now, we have two vaccines authorized for emergency use, Moderna and Pfizer. We have one, Johnson & Johnson, that's seeking emergency authorization now. And I believe that there might be six others in the pipeline that are distributed across some of the three phases of clinical trials. So, so two questions here, where are we on the Johnson & Johnson vaccine approval? And what about the others in the pipeline? So yeah, today was very timely to be able to see in the headlines that the FDA has started reviewing and is uh, you know looking at the efficacy and safety data and pleased with that. Um, we're hoping Friday, if not Saturday, that the FDA will authorize emergency use for that vaccine, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which has two big advantages over the current ones. Um, there's always pros and cons, and we want to be able to get the first vaccine that we're offered. But the two advantages to Johnson & Johnson is that it is a one-dose. Um, that's how they did their clinical trials. So we don't have to worry about scheduling that second dose three or four weeks later. And the other advantage is it does not have to be kept at the temperatures that the RNA vaccines can have. So it's going to enable us to be able to get the vaccines out into the community easier. So right now, everybody is traveling whatever distance they need to, to be able to go to the vaccine. And I know various parts of the country, people had to travel quite a distance and in the winter and it gets dark early, that's a concern. Or what if you don't have that ability to be able to get out of your house or don't have transportation? So the Johnson & Johnson not only is going to be available at the centers, but we're going to be able to really change that methodology and be able to also get that into you know, the communities where we need it. For example, Yankee Buses has donated like 40 buses. They gutted them, put five vaccination stations in, and they're going to be taking those out, kind of like you might have seen mammogram buses that go out into communities and things like that. Fabulous. Uh, Dr. Kuchara, thank you. You know, I'm curious, you, you talked to us a little bit at our, at our last community conversations about the vaccines. And we really spent a lot of time talking about the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine and that they were mRNA based vaccines. And I'm curious, is, J, is the Johnson & Johnson vaccine any different? So it is different as well as you had mentioned ones that are coming down the, the, the pipeline. So um, this vaccine is actually an adeno, adenovirus based vaccine. So it is a different type of vaccine. It also doesn't have those same lipids in it. So if somebody had an allergic reaction to the Moderna and Pfizer, it's really rare. We haven't seen very many, but in those cases, um, if you've had an allergic reaction to the first dose, you don't wanna receive the second dose. So the Johnson & Johnson could certainly be something uh, eligible for, for those people. And then the next one, the Novavax, that um, I anticipate might be the next one to be approved is a protein-based one. So they are uh, three different classifications of vaccines. Great, Dr. Kuchara, thank you so much. So Dr. Norbus, I wanna get back to you a little bit on this. Um, just because I'm curious if, if this J&J, &J, if the Johnson & Johnson vaccine becomes approved and like Dr. Kuchara said, it's a one dose, mm -hmm. I, you know, people had said that, well, if it's approved on February 26, it possibly could make it into the arms by March 1st. That seems very aggressive to me. 
but you know, I'm, I'm curious about, um, you know, once that one dose vaccine is approved and it can be stored, I think Dr. Kachar alluded to this, it can be stored for two years at minus 20 degrees or, or at least three months in most standard refrigerated temperatures. What does this mean really for vaccine distribution and the bottleneck that you talked about? Would this kind of help to clear that bottleneck? Uh, it, it, the temperature issue will clear many bottlenecks because of, uh, it, it will um, accelerate many processes. The, what is called, what we call the cold supply chain is a completely different issue. Meaning when you have to transport uh, vaccines or food into, in a given temperature, that will help. Now, uh, as, as far as March 1st, uh, okay, um, that could be from a point of view, could be optimistic, but on the other side, we have to think as Dr. Curran uh, was saying some moments ago, we are learning as we walk. Okay, and so every uh, we have been, we are very new at this. Uh, we were very new in operations as well as um, in everything. So in this process, so we um, um, the experience that we go gaining is uh, make us uh, more able in the next step. So I see the as you say at the, at the beginning of the question, if March first, I say that as a kind of optimist, but. Um, Let's let's see that uh, we have learned uh, in the process. Great, Myra, thank her. Um, Horam, I wonder if I could come back to you on this one with your Chris. If I could ask you to pull out a crystal ball, um, do do you know how many? I mean, is there? You know, I there's talk in the news about, you know, Pfizer has this many doses available ready to ship in the pipeline. Um, Moderna has this many. Johnson and Johnson, if it's approved, has this many in the pipeline. Do you? know how many doses of the Johnson & Johnson might make it to Connecticut? And, and I think the second part of my question is, how is Connecticut preparing for the potential approval of that vaccine? So um, Johnson & Johnson vaccine, once it goes through the FDA approval process, they may be what they're looking at currently, you know, as we, uh, 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 as much we know today is about maybe up to like towards the end of March, they may be like up to like 20 million doses by that time, which I do want to uh, mention, which would be less than what they had anticipated previously, about maybe 15 million, million doses less than the original anticipated uh, uh, production goal. So out of those 20 million doses for the whole country, the Connecticut distribution will be dependent on the formula, whatever you know the uh, federal government will have based on several factors. So... Yes, that will be a welcome addition to the choices we will have to administer vaccines, but it's, we are, you know, it will be too soon to make any predictions until A, it uh, receives its uh, emergency use authorization, and B, we will have to wait to hear more from the federal government to make plans in DPH in Connecticut. So I would hesitate to make any uh, prompt uh, uh, responses, but the company Johnson & Johnson is expecting to produce up like 20 million doses by the end of March if the approval process goes through smoothly. Fair enough. I appreciate that. I want to just add something in there ahead, as far as distribution. So one of the uh, groups that we're looking at, especially is perhaps, um, you know, people of color and minorities and Connecticut is about the same as the country. We're not doing necessarily a lot better or worse. Um, but there's talk of perhaps getting uh, going into churches and barbershops and being able to do outreach. And the Johnson & Johnson makes that available where the Moderna and the Pfizer, that'd be extremely difficult to do. That's actually, that's good news uh, on the front, I think, for Connecticut. So I want to turn this back to the variants. So in our last discussion, we talked about COVID variants, specifically um, that generally speaking, viruses constantly change through a process called mutation, and that new variants of a virus are expected to occur over time. Sometimes those, those new variants emerge and disappear, and other times new variants emerge and persist. We now know that multiple variants of the virus that causes COVID have been documented in the United States and globally um, and, and the three that we mentioned in our prior conver conversation are the UK variant, the South African variant, and the variant that I believe is from Brazil. 
so I'm curious, are there any other variants that we need to be made aware of, or are these the three that we are in the race to keep from spreading? And I think maybe, is it Jeff, I'm going to go to Dr. Mittal with this one? Uh, sure, yeah. So the, the three variants that you mentioned um, are the, the primary variants that we've been hearing about and the, the primary variants that we need to be um, concerned about. There is another variant that's uh, starting to emerge um, with increased surveillance um, out of California, um, but the, the UK, the Brazilian, and the um, South African variants are the, the primary ones. So the, the, you know, the big concern with, with the variant is, is it more transmissible and is it more severe or more deadly? Um, the, with the increase in frequency that we see these variants, it's, it seems pretty apparent that they are more transmissible. Um, we don't see much of any data that they're more, that they cause more severe or more deadly disease. Okay, so so Dr. Mittal, so, so that's the stuff we know about the variants. What don't we know about them yet? And I guess my second part of the question is with regard to the vaccines, are the Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson vaccines protective against these variants? So yeah, so there's a, there's a lot we know, don't know about the variants right now. Uh, we don't know why they're more transmissible. Um, it's a, you know, a, a fairly safe assumption that perhaps it's because uh, it could take fewer um, viral particles to, to expose a person to, to, to have them become infected. That would be one um, viable reason why it might be more transmissible. And that's, you know, as we'll, we'll talk about a little bit, that's maybe one of the reasons to start double masking, um, you know, why that might be effective. Um, as far as the, um, the vaccines go, you know, the, the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine are still effective against the variants. They, it seems like, you know, with the way they're looking at it, there might be some slight decrease in effectiveness, um, but it, it's thought that they're still going to be effective, especially at um, preventing severe disease. And the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, when you look at the numbers, you know, if you look at Moderna and Pfizer, when they first came out, it was 95% effective. And now Johnson & Johnson comes out and it's 72% effective. Th that is a difference, but you have to remember that the Johnson & jo Johnson clinical trial was happening when these variants were more, you know, out there more. So it's not surprising that those numbers are a little bit lower. What's really, um, What's really good about the Johnson Johnson vaccine is that because we know these South South African variants are out there, they actually tar targeted South Africa for their clinical trials, and they have a lot of data out of South Africa, um, and it shows that even in South Africa, where this variant um, is very prevalent, you know, we're seeing, um, you know, it, it still be 82% effective against severe um, severe COVID infection, and you know, still uh, very effective um, against. Uh, you know, uh, catching the disease at all. Janelle, so may Dr. I Mattel, add? Just, I'm sorry, go ahead. Please do, please do. So I was just going to mention, and I, you know, the, thank you for all the, uh, you know, the information on these different variants, but I did want to uh, just put like something in perspective. January 10th, 2020, when we first, we had the first genomic sequence of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. February 3rd, 2021, we have more than 460,000 different uh, sequences. And I would like to give credit to CDC on uh, something that they are putting together in place. So they're collecting from all state labs up to like 750 different specimens will be, you know, uh, uh, shipped, you know, transferred over to the CDC database. And even now CDC is going to partner with uh, local private labs, uh, and they will be up to like, you know, uh, I, I think like five to 6,000 different um, sequences, they will be transferring to this publicly available uh, database for monitoring and learning more about these different variants within the US. So yes, there are some sequences that are coming or some variants that are coming from outside US, but there is now uh, collection of the data and then analysis of that data will be happening from within US. So CDC has put together a plan in place, which again, you know, it will take some time to gather that massive amount of data and then interpretation and analyzing, but I think they are taking steps in the right direction. Perfect. I'm glad, I'm glad you added that. Thank you very much. I want Can to get back add something to that real quick. Please do. So Moderna has actually also started a new clinical trial. So they just uh, have sequenced a new 
um, RNA vaccine. So they're going to be giving people a third booster of the existing one and comparing that against the new one that they have now manufactured. So the RNA virus uh, vaccines are really quick to be able to turn around for these. And they're gonna be studying that and determining will that you know new um, vaccine variation now be more effective or with a third booster. So they're comparing that. And then the other part of it is the quicker we can vaccinate everybody, which obviously also depends on supply. So not all of it's within our control, but with regard to people being hesitant, the quicker we vaccinate everybody, the less chance for some of these variants to become so prevalent. So it's not at an average person that these variants are usually occurring. Um, there's been a person in Boston who was immunocompromised and infected with the virus for many, many months. So most of us, right, we get sick and then we clear it. Um, this person actually, because they were immunocompromised, carried the virus in them for months, and they actually saw these mutations, these variants come about. So if we vaccinate everybody quicker, we'll decrease the frequency of those variants being able to spread as prevalently as they do. Great. Thank you for that. I do want to piggyback off of something that Dr. Mittal said that leads into the booster question, Lisa, that, that you had just mentioned too, I think. There was some discussion, Dr. Mertal, about this slight decrease in effectiveness against variants. And, and I guess my question to that was, I was curious about a booster. You know, I know that there are some studies in the works that are looking at the vaccine and variants. And I'm curious if you believe that we may need a booster of some sort in the future. And what might that look like? I think, Lisa, you had alluded to it a little bit, that we might need it in a year or three years or five years. Do we have any idea of, of what that looks like? Or is this the whole process of gathering the data now, it's so new. Help me understand that. I think they're gathering that data. Um, the Moderna doesn't know, um, you know, either a third booster of the existing one or a third booster with a new one. That's what the trial is designed to be able to figure out. And that's what the science is gonna be able to give us. We're still too new with that, I think, to answer that question. Got it, got it. You know, I, I do want to um, turn it to the fact that, um, you know, a lot of people are tired. I've heard that from people that were tired. You know, we've been in this battle for over a year uh, when the first reported case of COVID happened in late January of 2020. Now we have these new variants, the vaccines are here, um, and, and people across um, uh, the U.S. are in some kind of um, uh, stage of vaccine, whether they have received none of it or all of it. And I know that some people are considering travel and re-emerging more now that they have become maybe vaccinated in some way, shape or form. What should we be doing right now as we work through this max vac mass vaccination process? I don't know. Lisa, do we want to? Sure. Um, so I guess the first part of that is we are all tired of this, right? That is just definitely, you know, we could do it for a short period of time, but we have to remember the virus doesn't care that we're tired, right? So the virus is not something that we could say, oh yeah, I understand you're tired of this. I'm going to give you a break. So we have to keep that in mind with regard to social distancing and masking. And I certainly want to travel and visit my new nephew. And, you know, it's hard not to. So that's the first part. The second part is that as we do get vaccinated and become immune, some of that will be able to be a little easier, right? We still want to be able to make sure people wear masks and do some of the things that we are still having in place. We're not releasing those, but I think that that confidence is going to slightly increase where we can start being able to do those, those things in small increments. Right. Let's talk about double masking. I think, Dr. Mittal, you kind of alluded to that um, when you were talking about the variants and this idea of double masking. And I know that some people I have seen wearing two masks, some people I see wearing one mask, um, uh, and, and all sorts of varieties of, of wearing and not wearing masks. And so I'm just curious. I just want to get this out on the table. Um, what, what is the recommendation for masks and, and what should we be doing? So, I mean, I, I think the, the recommendation is, um, you know, if, if you can, and it, it doesn't, you know, you know, you don't have any, um, medical issues that prevent wearing two masks. 
it, it's not going to hurt to wear two masks. Um, what you know, what seems like common sense of more masks, you know, would would give you more protection. The CDC just came out with some data showing that that indeed is the case. Um, the biggest issue is when when people wear the disposable surgical mask, the the sides are open. Um, and so now you've seen, you know, there's a ton of videos on um, TikTok and YouTube showing how to fold the mask and knot it so that it's tighter around your cheeks. Um, and the CDC actually looked at that type of um, modification to the masks and also putting a, um, a uh, cloth mask over the surgical mask. And both of those are thought to just bring it closer to the cheeks and close that area that's that's open to um, virus getting out or getting in. And it showed to be, um, they, they showed the, the data was pretty impressive that it was significantly more effective at preventing um, transmission of droplets. Um, and one of the interesting things is, you know, we've heard that, you know, wearing a mask, it, it typically is more effective at protecting others from you transmitting it to them. And with wearing two masks, it seems like we're leveling the playing field a little bit that it's just as effective at protecting other people as it is protecting yourself. So nodding the mask or even more effective is a, um, a you know, cloth mask over the um, disposable masks and they're, they're very effective. But you still have to use, if you're gonna wear two masks and you're gonna be, it's gonna be bothersome and you're gonna be touching the mask and it's gonna fall down and you're gonna be adjusting it more, you have to kind of weigh those considerations as well. Got it, so fit matters and, and Dr. Mittal, what I'm hearing is two masks fit appropriately, work better than one, one certainly is better than none. And so the recommendation is let's at let's the very least wear a mask to help protect those around us. Would I be correct in, in saying that? Definitely. I wear, I, wear, I wear two masks these days. I do too. I do too. Okay. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move this to children and pregnancy. And Mary, thank you for being here. We know that pregnant women um, are at a risk of, of severe disease from COVID-19. What are the recommendations for pregnant women in regards to the vaccine? So right now, the recommendation is that if you are pregnant and you fall into a high-risk category or a category that's being immunized, that you should be immunized. There's no reason not to do it. So an example would be a healthcare worker who may be pregnant, um, certainly should go ahead and become vaccinated. Pfizer has just recently started um, doing clinical trials on pregnant women. They have 4,000 women in their study um, over the age of 18. And they're looking at women between, um, I believe 24 and 34 weeks gestation and they plan to follow those women along with following the infants, um, looking at their response and immunity after they're born through the age of about six months. Um, so that is, is in the works right now. They have you know, done studies in animals and have found no contraindications to giving the vaccine. And they also have had pregnant women in their clinical trials. There's women who have been in the trials who have become pregnant while in the trial. Um, so they have also found, you know, that 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 has been safe to provide the um, COVID vaccine to pregnant women too. So there is more to come, but the recommendation is because pregnant women are, are at high risk for serious illness, that they should, when their time is up, you know, there to be vaccinated, they should go ahead and have that vaccine. Great, Mary. Thank you. So, so I want to I want to talk about children too because I know we've been talking about 16 years and over. I heard a couple of other people mention ages a little bit earlier. So, um, do we have any updates on children and kind of where we are with regard to clinical trials involving children? Well, May 3rd, as of May 3rd, 16 and over, as far as the Pfizer vaccine, those children will be eligible to get the vaccine. Uh, Pfizer right now is in stage three clinical trials for children 12 to 15. So that will be the next group. Hopefully we'll have um, those answers out relatively soon. Five to 11 will be, children five to 11 are gonna be entered into the clinical trials within the next few months. And then they're looking at children under five towards the end of the year. So by the end of 2021, um, they should have eligibility for all age groups. Great, great, Mary, thank you for that update. I'm wondering if you can give me just a little bit of clarity around COVID vaccines and infertility. There has been some information circulating claiming that receiving a COVID-19 vaccine 
uh, could result in infertility or an increased risk for miscarriage. I was wondering if you can shed some light on this. From any information um, that I have read or that have come out of the clinical trials, there has been no evidence um, to prove that there's any correlation with miscarriage or infertility um, with the COVID vaccine. I don't know if anybody else has any other information in regards to that. Well, if you look at scientific plausibility, right? So this RNA, I'm talking about the two right now, of Pfizer and Moderna, the RNA goes inside of our cells. It's there for a very short period of time. Uh, we have RNAs, basically enzymes that chew up the RNA very quickly. It makes its protein. We mount an immune response to it and that RNA isn't sticking around. So there's not any real scientific plausibility of how it could affect fertility either. Great, thank you. J John, I want to go over to you quickly about this idea of um, requirements for, for vaccines. I do want to say masks, I know are required on planes, buses, trains, and other forms of public transportation. Um, do you think at some point vaccines will be required and what might that look like? I think when I was reading the, the paper the other week, it might've been last week, someone had made the comment of make sure we have our vaccine passport with us. So could this down the road be a requirement and what might that look like? And what, what might we need to have with us to prove that we've been vaccinated? I certainly think it will become a requirement down the road in some context, for instance, going to public schools, maybe going to universities and other kinds of higher education. Um, it's possible to have the mandate in the transportation system, certainly makes good public health sense. The practicalities of creating the passport that's not subject to forgery or a separate issue, it, it is possible. But at this point in time, all of the vaccines are being permitted to be used under an emergency youth authorization by the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA. We cannot mandate that anybody in any context have the vaccine until the vaccines receive full approval. Now, Pfizer, for example, anticipates filing for full approval in April of this year and receiving full approval by the end of this year. And, and that's much quicker than usual because we have so much data because so many millions of people have received the vaccine under the emergency use authorization. So in long story, a little bit shorter, in some context, I do imagine this will happen. It will be probably not until at least early 2022 and maybe later than that. Got it. Got it. Thank you so much. I want to open this up, Colleen. I want to invite Colleen into our conversation today and open it up to questions that we might have from our audience. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being on our panel this evening. Um, I've enjoyed listening. Absolutely. I'm Colleen Thompson. I'm in the Dean's office at the School of Health Sciences at Quinnipiac. So we do a few questions from the audience members that are here tonight. And um, some of them, you answered a few. So thank you, Mary, for responding again to the, the fertility question. It does keep rising. So I appreciate your response to that. We still are hearing those questions. There's a question here from one of our audience members about um, those who don't want to get the vaccine. And so the question is, will the people who don't want to get the vaccine be helping to continue to spread COVID? Thoughts on that? Absolutely. I can talk from a personal perspective. Um, I contracted COVID twice this past year, uh, first in March and then later on in December. Both times got sufficiently sick that my physician wife called 911 to take it for an ambulance to take me to the emergency room. Now I had complicating factors. I also was diagnosed with cancer early last year. I mean, I've had treatment now. Um, but um, uh, yes, the vaccine is effective. We think it's more effective than actually having the illness. And though I just got over the illness for the second time, I waited my appropriate uh, quarantine time in order to take my vaccine. I got the vaccine. I think it, we know that the vaccine is effective in so many people. I think we have a public duty to our neighbors, to our family, to anybody else to do what we can. So um, yeah, get the vaccine, please. And if you don't, you are contributing to a public health emergency. So I'll echo what John just said. And I'll just say, you know, uh, I trust our scientific community. I believe in scientific achievement. So it's incremental progress, but it's a step in the right direction. Now, are there concerns, long-term safety and all those? I absolutely understand people's concern. We don't know how it might impact five years from now, but we didn't know 
only 18 months ago that this will be a conversation we would be having via Zoom today, right? So things change over time and we have to be open to the emerging scientific evidence and act upon it at, at that time with the best tools that are available to us. So if you ask me today, if I have a patient in my clinical office who's asking me this question, should I get vaccine or not? My answer will be, if you have one offered to you, take it. So yeah, it's think- that simple, we know, unless there is any contraindication due to clinical medical reasons, absolutely. But if there is no medical contraindication, if it's offered to you, please take it. And if I can piggyback on that, so it's natural to have questions, it's normal to be hesitant, but as he just said, the people you want to seek out your answers from are scientists. You want to speak that out from your primary care person, your physician, get the answers from the right sources. So it's okay right. to, you know, to wonder or you know, be worried about something you might have heard, but just seek out good resources for those answers. Right. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that, Lisa. Thank you. Jeff, what were you going to add to that? Oh, yeah, just it's, it, you know, getting vaccinated. It's one of those situations where you could do something that's going to help yourself, but also help others. You know, every person that gets vaccinated helps protect those who, for whatever reason, cannot get vaccinated. There are a number of individuals who can, might not be able to mount an immune response. So by getting vaccinated, you are protecting those you know, who are most vulnerable in our population. Think about the timeline of when our kids are going to be able to be vaccinated. That you know, might be a, a little ways off. So everybody getting vaccinated protects those who can't or have not been vaccinated. And, and posting it on social media. I've seen a lot of people post their, you know, them with their you know, getting vaccinated, them with their card. It helps to make all of us have more faith and more confidence as we start to see more and more people get vaccinated. It actually helps. So if you're somebody that does social media and is willing to be able to post that out there, it's surprising the impact that that can have and make that part of community immunity go viral rather than the virus itself. All right. That's really good advice. Yeah, thank you for that. So thinking about the people that are vaccinated. So, so I get my vaccine, right? And I haven't had mine yet. I'm hoping one day. Um, so if I get my vaccine, should I continue to double mask? Short answer is yes. And we can talk all day about why and why not. Mm-hmm. But the short answer is absolutely until we have herd immunity, which will not be until we have 60, 70, 80% of the community vaccinated. And we are only talking about Connecticut. There are other states, there are other places where the vaccine administration rate may not be as good as we have done in Connecticut. Our positivity rate is less than 3%. Our, you know, our number statistics are improving, but we should not let our guard down. Even though you're fully vaccinated, I will still encourage every person to still continue to mask, please. Yeah, I would, I would follow it up and just say, yeah, we, you know, we know that vaccines um, help prevent people from getting sick, and it makes a lot of sense to assume that it will help prevent transmission, but we don't have that data yet. We just don't have the scientific data showing that vaccinated people are less likely to transmit. So until we know that data, and even afterwards, you know, wear your mask. That's great. That's great advice, Jeff. And I think that's, that's really what we need to hear just said straight out loud, you still could potentially transmit this virus, even though you're vaccinated, and that's something that people need to hear. Um, So along the lines of the mask question, someone wants to know how long should a disposable mask be worn before you dispose it? I'm going to let my biomedical colleagues answer this question. <laughs> Those <laughs> microbiologists are on this call <laughs> cringing right now. So one part of that, right, if it gets wet or if it gets dirty, I mean, you know, you change your underwear and it's dirty, you change your mask if it's get dirty. So common sense for part of it, certainly. Um, but a lot of the masks will say kind of like an eight hour period. And, you know, if you're if you're wearing it. So um, for me, with a cloth mask, I wear it that end of the day, it goes right into the laundry machine. Um, so it's basically something, but if you were going to wear it just because of an hour, you could put it in a paper bag. Let's say you have a doctor's appointment, you know, twice a week for, you know, a, a reoccurring uh, condition that you have. 
you, and you knew you're going to wear it about an hour, you could wear it a couple of times, put it in a paper bag. You want to make sure you're taking it off safely. You don't want to put it in a plastic bag because plastic could generate some moisture and bacteria. Um, but generally, you don't want to be wearing this for, I see some people hanging it on their rear view you know, mirror, and they're basically using it for like a month. Well, again, you wouldn't do that with your underwear. You know, use some common sense when it comes to the changing the mask. I want to add a practical comment. Use it until you have a substitute, until you have another one. I mean, I think a, a used mask is better than no mask. So please stock up. But if you don't have another one, wear it again, please. Yeah, I think for, you know, for some, there may be an, uh, you know, an economic issue as far as how often you're able to change your mask, even reusable masks. So, you know, think about it with, you know, if you could have a couple, you know, if you aren't able to wash them or if you're not able to, um, you know, uh, buy new ones, if you put them in a, you know, paper bag or, you know, a container where it could sit for a couple of days, a lot of the viral particles on there will become inactive over that time. Um, so that, you know, that's a, um, you know, that might be helpful. Try not to touch your mask at all. Just grab it by the loops and, you know, never touch the actual mask part. Um, so there are, you know, you know, there are some ways without having to buy a lot of new masks um, to, to make them last longer. And just to uh, add one small comment, uh, Jeff made a very good point. So if there are economic challenges or if there's any, for any reason, you know, that is a prohibitive factor, please uh, uh, reach out to Department of Public Health, your town hall, your city hall. They will be able to help facilitate securing enough masks for the family, for the people. So I think Jeff uh, mentioned a, a very important point that we should always, you know, we should think about there may be other factors. and. If there are, please reach out for help and there will be help. And then Jeff mentioned, don't touch the front of your mask. So if you are a crafter and have ever worked with glitter or have any kids or ever got a package with glitter, you know, glitter's everywhere. <laughs> Just think of the front of your mask as contaminated with glitter and you don't want to touch the glitter because it's going to go all over. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a great analogy. Thank you. Appreciate that. So I'm going to go back to the vaccine questions because um, I like this question. If a parent doesn't get vaccinated, are they putting their children in danger? Are we talking about the coronavirus vaccine or in general? Oh, well, if you would like to answer because, it in both ways, I assume they mean coronavirus vaccine. Right. So we don't really have any approved vaccines for children at this point. So I'm not sure if I could answer this question uh, uh, scientifically because we don't know the safety in kids. So I will hesitate to answer that question for kids at this point. I think they were asking if is by not the parent not getting vaccinated, are they oh. yeah, are I, they putting their child at risk? Oh, Does yeah. that make sense? Yes. And and the answer would be yes, because children aren't in that group to get vaccinated at this point in time. So it would be if parents are eligible for any reason, grandparents, they should get the vaccine. And by doing that, they are helping keep their children safer. And, you know, although we know that children don't necessarily get as seriously ill as other populations, um, we do know that COVID does have certain effects, even on, on cardiac muscle and children returning to play and to sports. Um, so there are sequelae that come, you know, and from having COVID as a, as a pediatric patient. So it would be extremely important for um, parents to get immunized. You know, the more people do get immunized, the more safe those populations they can't will be. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. And I'm sorry, Dr. Gilman, if I asked the question the first time, no. I'm a little confusing. No, I miss, miss her herself. There's an interesting question here about what progress we've made, um, <clears throat> specifically related to the World Health Organization made in determining the cause or the source of COVID. Does anyone want to try to comment on that? Yes. I mean, viruses and you know, have a host and a lot of the coronaviruses have an animal host. And as humans interact more with animals, we're going to come in contact more with those. So if you look at MERS, which is a similar, uh, you know, coronavirus, um, it's a camel interaction with a human. So, you know, people are encountering more and more into, you know, animals and zoonotic pathogens, basically germs that also can go from humans to animals and back and forth are becoming more popular 
together as we become more dominant on the planet and we want to be able to in, you know encroach into other areas of the world so these things are going to to happen yeah i think you know i don't think there's been a, a whole lot of, of concrete new information about you know how or where it started um, but again it is important to continue to fund and support the research, you know, going into these areas and, and trying to get ahead of these outbreaks. Right. Thank you. Thanks, um, everyone, for that response. Um, one of the questions here, it, we're back to the mask, and actually, this is kind of interesting, I hadn't thought about it. We've been talking about double masking and being safe with your mask. What about the N95 masks, right? They're supposed to be the, the best mask that you can wear. Is, is that enough on its own? Is that you can wear by itself or should be double masking still there? You don't want to double mask with an N95, um, but you need to be fitted to really properly be wearing uh, an N95. Uh, my stepdaughter works for the medical examiner's office and she went through, you know, there's four different variations and she had to be fitted. And there's actually like testing that they do. Obviously, during an emergency, we've kind of, uh, you know, ramped that up. And sometimes our healthcare professionals wore any N95 that they had access to. But um, I do know people that work um, as EMTs and one of them accidentally put an N95 on top of another one. And she said, I didn't understand why I was having trouble. And then I looked down and realized I had accidentally put two on. So no, for, for an N95, no. But we still are trying to reserve those for our healthcare professionals, not for everyday use. Sure. Absolutely. Correct. Yeah, that's good advice. And there are there are newer ones coming out, you know, just, you know, do your research, make sure they're from a reputable source. But, um, you know, like the KN95, they're, they're just going through different um, testing and certification procedures. Um, so as long as you get it from a reputable source, you know, you can look at some of the alternatives to the typical N95. Yeah, the CDC actually has a list of KN95, what Jeff was just talking right. about, and it'll have ones that are approved. Um, and those would fit tighter, um, and I would only wear one of those. Right. So the, the, the KN95 one is a little different from the N95, and, but still you could get away with just wearing one if you're wearing it correctly. Sound right, okay, good. Um, there's an interesting question here. Um, it's a little long, so I'm not gonna read the whole question. I'm gonna give you that condensed version and I'm gonna put it in, in my terms. What if, so there's so much going on and there's all these variants and it's scary and we've heard all of that. So what do you think about like a cocktail of vaccines? Can you, what would more than one variety of vaccine or one kind of vaccine protect you even more? Is that even a possibility or a thing? It's a Oh, ahead. Ahead, Lisa. So I don't think we're planning on giving people like, you know, five different vaccines at once, but as the vaccines and the clinical trials start to come, Jeff had mentioned, we haven't yet studied transmission. If say the Johnson and Johnson prevents transmission much better and we have vaccinated, you know, a hundred million people in the United States um, against with Pfizer or Moderna, we might want to give a booster with the Johnson and Johnson. So I don't think it's a cocktail necessarily, but as the data starts to come out as maybe one is superior for one particular reason or one particular group. Uh, perhaps there's a group of people that one didn't work as effectively as, as another, or as I said, it, one might protect better against transmission than a booster. But I don't think there's any plans of giving uh, you know five different uh, ones at once. Thank you. There was um, a question also in, in the chat there about what Connecticut is doing. So maybe we'll, we'll head this one to Dr. Guman, but um, apparently Massachusetts, and I don't know if this program is still happening, but are briefly discussed doing a plus one, you know, bring your partner to get your vaccine. Is, is there any possibility of something like that happening in Connecticut? You could bring your significant other and both of you get a two for one vaccine. So if there was, my wife would have been vaccinated. <laughs> She's still <laughs> waiting for her turn. So not that I'm aware of. <laughs> And not that there's any consideration uh, that I'm aware of. So I am not aware of the uh, rationale behind uh, Massachusetts uh, policy, but we don't have any uh, consideration at present time in Connecticut. And I'm not sure I'm not sure what the policy is in Massachusetts, but I have heard elsewhere that they've been trying to increase the vaccination rate in older populations by saying, if you're a younger person who has access to transportation, 
if you bring an, an older person with you, you know, above 65, above 75, then you would, could get your vaccine as well. And get that not, has been it's great, actually. Yeah. And that has been brought up in a different way as well. Like if you're a caregiver to a uh, high risk individual. So this was brought up in our, you know, uh, committee meetings and was discussed upon. But um, so there are other situations where it may be more plausible. But as of today, currently, the plus one is not uh, that I'm aware of in Connecticut. So I am aware of people in a few of the New England states that their um, loved one was in the appropriate age group and they had an appointment at the end of the day and they accompanied their loved one at the end of the day. And there are times that there are leftover and I have had about right. 20 of my friends get vaccinated by going with, so they were the plus one. They didn't have an appointment. If there was no extra, they wouldn't have gotten vaccinated. But about 20 people I know did get vaccinated through that approach just by making the appointment at the end of the day. Um, they certainly don't want to throw out vaccine. Right. Uh, so right. sometimes there is some leftover at the end of the day. Right. So the goal in Connecticut is to vaccinate every single dose possible. So like Lisa mentioned, if it's like, you know, 455 and you close at five and there's like two doses left and two arms available and willing to take, I think the uh, rationale is to utilize those doses uh, rather than discarding. So that would be true. So I, I hate to, to stop great conversation. I do wanna say we are at 7.30. I just wanna leave Dr. Guman uh, just a few seconds of just advice you have for Connecticut citizens while waiting for the, for the vaccine. So I, you know, if I can leave you guys all to think about then just a few things, please, please, please continue to mask, hand washing, keeping your distance, physical distance, avoiding large gatherings. And I will add one more thing, avoid any unnecessary traveling for now, because we are uh, getting closer and closer to some better vaccinations in our communities. So I think still mask, hand washing, distancing, and as much unnecessary travel as we can avoid. I would leave you with that. Great. Dr. Guman, thank you. Thank you once again to our panelists and participants present today. Dr. Guman, special thank you to you for being here and providing this important information to our community. I want to share with you some resources, a slide that we share with you. If you put your phone, uh, your camera on the QR code up there, uh, um, we have developed a nice FAQ document for you regarding COVID and its vaccines. Please do place your phone over that. We also have some other uh, resources for you. Um, Thank you so much for joining us. Please do join us in the future as we continue our focused COVID-19 vaccine community conversations on behalf of Quinnipiac University and the School of Health Sciences. We wish you health and wellness. Be safe, be well, wear your masks, and go Bobcats. <laughs>